Let's hit the H's, I'm so undefined. The watch on our committal. Then you will know that you are still the fat face, fresh face, sixth grade, earth, fed it, bro, model, red cap, size, six and seven eighths. You will know that you are still the kids sitting quiet. The kids sitting quiet. On the creased vinyl green seat bus. I'm the same. What's up, everybody? It's been a minute, but welcome back to The House List. My name is Peter Agassi, and I'm your host. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm sorry for the little delay, but we're back on track with The House List. I got a lot of stuff I want to talk about in this intro, so let's just jump right into it. First, I'm sorry it's taking me a minute to get a new episode up. Um, I was out of the country, and then I was traveling a little bit in the country, but also... Um, as soon as I got over to Europe, I was in Hungary, I was in Budapest, uh, visiting my family. As soon as I landed, uh, I heard the news about my dear friend and friend to many people, DJ Steph from San Francisco, um, who suddenly passed away October 1st and, um, was totally shocked and confused very sad uh, as I just spoke to her like the week before and we had just done a show in the Bay with Prince Paul um, just maybe two weeks before that Uh, but during my trip I started working quietly and diligently on a celebration of life concert for her which just took place in San Francisco on the 12th of this month October 2017 um, and it was a big success it was a moving night uh, a lot of people I hadn't seen in a very long time a lot of groups performed who hadn't performed in many years some uh, more than a decade it was a lineup of a lot of hip-hop artists and DJs uh, from the Bay Area Steph if you don't know who she is was a really integral part of the San Francisco and the general Bay Area hip-hop community, but she was also just a, a, a great record collector. She published a zine called Vinyl Exchange from 1995 to 97, and she supported a lot of acts, underground and otherwise, and definitely championed a lot of groups. She went to a lot of people's shows, bought their merch, played their records, uh, as well as just like spread the word about their stuff. I met her through Tim Holland, aka Soul, when Anticon was just first starting out, late 90s, in the Bay. Um, Tim and Brandon, my good friend, uh, introduced me to Steph back then, and we've been buddies ever since. And I know I was one of many, many, many people that uh, considered her a close friend. So my condolences to her husband, Serge, and her family, and the community in general in San Francisco. So I just got back. I'm in New York. Uh, We had a great show. It was beautiful. A lot of people performed, and I booked the show all while I was in Hungary. So we had Del the Funky Homo Sapien, Peanut Butter Wolf, Zion I, Z-Man, Eddie K, DJ Mars, uh, DJ Quest, Sacred Hoop, Various Blends, Pismo, Eclipse 427, Controller 7, Gel, Odd Nostom, uh, so many more people, and even our guests on today's show, Yoni Wolf, a.k.a. Y. Many know him from uh, his uh, many releases on Anticon, one of the core members of the Anticon uh, original kind of family of artists. Um, 
and uh, we have been trying to get together for a while, and we made it work. We recorded in Oakland, California, not that long ago, a couple of days ago now, and had a great conversation. Granted, it was the day after, it was two days after uh, the show in San Francisco at the Elbow Room, and so I was definitely a little stream of conscious uh, languid maybe is the right word or uh, I don't know if lucid would be would qualify here but I was a bit tired we did in the evening but we had a great conversation it was candid and uh, I've known him for 20 years now and I've done many shows with him I booked him as a promoter uh, but also went on tour with him I've DJ for him at the elbow room at this particular show I was his backing DJ as well and uh, so we talk about a lot of stuff we talk about his um, early days growing up in Cincinnati, coming to the Bay. Now he lives back in Cincinnati. Um, it's great. It's a really great conversation. It was a treat to get up with him. I love the guy. I love watching him perform. I'm a big fan of his music. And um, he just put out a new record earlier this year called Moline, which I suggest uh, uh, peeping out, buying that joint. Also, he has a podcast that's been going on for a long time, too, called The Wandering Wolf, which when I was sick and kind of on the mend and recovering, I listened to that a lot. A lot of personal uh, musings, and, and uh, it's dope. So if you're a fan of his and you didn't already know about it, then please go peep that out. <clears throat> and if this is your first time checking out The House List, this podcast with me, Peter Agostin, your host, then please, by all means, subscribe. It's on iTunes. You can find it on Stitcher, Google Play soundcloud and youtube if you listen to podcasts on soundcloud or even on youtube really for that matter on say you just check them out on a on a desktop computer you're working from home you're washing the dishes you're cleaning up you know and you have a soundcloud account then please by all means repost it on your account for me this is a diy type of thing i love trying to get the word out word of mouth style so it really hits people that truly care about the artists i'm talking to the kinds of conversations we have very casual uh it's not like i'm interviewing someone in any kind of formal sense so and plus i just do this all for the love too for the most part you know I, i'm i'm in my back in my house in brooklyn recording this intro and um I got a bunch of new episodes done and in the works, so we're going to get back on track with that too. So thank you guys for tuning in. If you already subscribed, if you're new to it, good looking out. Please keep coming back for more. Um, go back and check out some of the previous episodes too. I've been doing this for a little over a year now, so there's some great, great conversations to check out. Also, I just wanted to say something real quick about Lil B. I saw what happened, which um, as of now I think was yesterday or the day before. I can't really remember. But, yo, man, just, that's so fucked up. You know, so my uh, thoughts and, 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 and shout outs to Lil B, the bass god, coming back from the Bay myself, huge fan of him. Um, and, uh, yeah, just saw some, some dumb shit go down and even saw the video, which is just heartbreaking and totally unnecessary and total bullshit. So uh, props to him for uh, making it known and doing it in a respectful, peaceful type of way. And... Um, yeah, you know, I just and seeing the outpouring of people uh, supporting him and stuff is uh, very heartwarming. So yes, here we go. Why don't we jump into this? My conversation with the one and only Yoni Wolf, aka Y, here on the House List with Peter Agustin. Again, if I come across um, like I'm stoned or something like that, please forgive me. I just. Uh, <laughs> I've been traveling a lot, and this show that we did for DJ Steph um, a few days before was an intense experience, and I was uh, and I was recovering. I still am, honestly. Uh, so anyway, with that being said, please enjoy my conversation with the one and only Yoni Wolf here on the House List. I don't know. I guess for me, as like a, I have kind of like a personal attachment to it because I've known you for a long time now. Mm -hmm. um, and I met you here in the Bay. I mean, I met you like... 20 years ago, maybe. <laughs> uh, 18 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was like... 99. Two, 99, 2000. Yeah, 99. Yeah, in fact... Stuffed animals. I think that's the first time I met you. Yeah. Probably. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, which was a 
you know, for people that may not know what that is anymore. I mean, they, no one knows what that is because <laughs> yeah. it never came out. <laughs> yeah. Although I had a tape of it and I lost yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, that's how. Uh, but it was like an, it was an album. Yeah. Of some magnitude, right? Something. That had like a bunch of people. I mean, yeah. it's kind of hard to describe. It was, but... Yeah, it's just a fun like group album. Yeah. So I was there during some of the process of recording that. Yeah. And I was filming stuff and I filmed a good amount of, uh, you know, what was going on with Anticon at that time, which was like kind of like the seminal sort of early days, I guess, in a way. And I think it was when you had either just moved out or you were like were in the process of moving out. No, I, I hadn't moved out yet. Oh, okay. I was visiting out for that album. I moved out in 2001, so it was oh, wow. a couple okay. years before I moved out here. Yeah, yeah. I have this video of you freestyling on Calex at, on Oliver Wang's radio oh, show. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oliver Wang made a name for himself. He that, did, yeah. yeah. He did well, man. He did, did yeah. really well. I mean, what's so funny is I actually met Oliver Wang on like the... On the you know, the message board on the yeah. rec dot music hip hop thing on like okay. the news group was pre message board in like 96 or something like that so he gave me my first shot to write reviews 12 inch reviews in herb magazine and you know at that time uh, herb was kind of a major tastemaker and stuff um and yeah and then, urb not herb yes i mean now it's funny because it just doesn't even exist no you know but it was a very well put together publication. Mm -hmm. Very proud to have written in it and uh, all that. But yes, you were freestyling. Uh, and then I have like this other really amazing, if I, I would say iconic video of everyone sitting on the couch in this house. Uh, I have a memory. Of that's like uh, near Lake Merritt, but I'm not sure what part of Oakland that is. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. Like somewhere out near like me. Yeah, I know I'm Yeah, which is like the time that you guys were recording that record and yeah. stuff like that. Yep. Um, so, and my perception of you back then too was that like out of this group of like pretty like sort of like edgy, eccentric, like 20 year olds, you know, like that you are even the furthest on the fringe of all that shit. Like at that point I in time. I felt that way. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely felt like an outsider. I yeah. mean, as far as like, like stylistically and like your delivery, because for, I mean, and this is all perception too. So totally relative, you know? And I think in a way it's like kind of interesting how your career from that point to now, how it's like kind of like, uh, you know, flowed and, you know, moved in different ways and directions and stuff. Uh, because when I first yeah met you, it was seemed so like obtruse that I had a, coming from a hip straight hip hop background, you know, um, and like, this is like you rapping next to Circus, you know, who also was, you know, he was also pretty out there in his own way, <laughs> way out there. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, I don't know. It was just, um, it's, it's just, uh, it was such a unique period of time, one, and where you've gotten to since then, too. And I kind of want to get a little, little more specific, but nevertheless, I, I'd love to talk a little bit more about like just what that period was like. If oh, you remember how you gosh, recall it, I, you know, I, I honestly, I've learned more and more. And maybe since I've, I smoke weed every night now, and maybe that's affected me. I don't know. I don't have the greatest memory for for the past, uh, but I'll try. Don't you think? <laughs> don't uh, yet yeah, somehow? How are you going to bed at ten o'clock every night if you're smoking oh, weed every day? God, that must be take some discipline, right? I, well, no, ten o'clock here at home it's more like midnight or oh, something. Okay. You know what? Now because I'm, I'm still kind of on East Coast time, and you're trying to keep it on that. No, that it's just it, I've just been super tired. That's all. Right, I'm um, exhausted. Yeah, me too, uh, but. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, my memory not 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 that great, but but it was it was a it was a it was a very cool time, and the possibilities did seem, um, you know, the sky felt like the limit, you know. Yeah. Um, and how old were you when you came here? Uh, at that time, I must have been yeah, nineteen or twenty. Amazing. Yeah, nineteen. Nineteen, I was. Did you go to Did you go to college after high school? Yeah. I in did Ohio. Yeah, in, at uh, in Cincinnati, uh, the University of Cincinnati, like the art school. Oh, there. cool. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, because I mean, even moving from that city to a place like Oakland, I mean, they're very different places. Right? Oh yeah, I mean the first the first time I, I visited uh, up it, up this way might have been might have been that trip or maybe one trip before it. Uh-huh. But um, I went to Monterey to visit my high school buddy who had moved uh-huh. there straight after high school. And and then up to Oakland, I think I think maybe for that that thing, and I just was astounded by the uh like just the the just the like the way that the landscape looked like all yeah. the crazy like uh, plants and stuff yeah oh like Mario Brothers or something and, <laughs> you know like Cincinnati is so is so is so gray and dull like it, it just was it just felt like you know all of a sudden. You know, you pull the film off of off of the uh, you know the television that had been on there yeah. the whole time since you bought it, and you didn't realize it had this like plastic film on it or whatever. Mm-hmm. To so that, and then it's everything's brighter and more vibrant. You know, yeah. I don't know if that was the best analogy. You know what I mean? No, no. Well, I mean, California can be a very alluring, uh, you know. seductive place. <laughs> you know? Yes. I mean, yeah. especially I came from the East Coast. I mean, yeah, I, I was. I fell in love with. Uh, I lived. You out lived on, up in Arcata, right? I did. It was different, but it's like a smaller town version of it, with much more, maybe not more, but by per capita, but a lot of transient culture. Yeah. Um, but beautiful nonetheless. I mean, more with like the redwoods and like old growth, like forests, like on the beach and shit. And but there's something about California that is truly see that, beautiful. See that small town shit kind of appeals to me more. And I, you know, I don't know that particular town. I mean, I've, I've been there. You you brought us there maybe yeah, the first you, time we went. Yeah. And maybe I've been there two, three times, but uh, I don't know it that well. But I, something about small town California very much appeals to me. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I mean California in general. I mean, it has this. Uh, there's like this kind of dark um, underbelly of like murder and mystery i think that is somehow entrenched like in underground you know in a way that's i don't even know what you're talking about but maybe (laughs) maybe this is true i I don't know that's how i feel maybe maybe more so like in around los angeles and okay like Like what some chinatown type shit like yeah china like chinatown the movie the movie is what i mean not chinatown the place yeah right right yeah where there is uh just a lot of yeah, mystique, perhaps. Yeah. And uh, that I think it's when you grow up either on the East Coast. Like Cincinnati, I would not call like a Midwestern town, although I guess technically it might be. But it, Cincinnati it's is... Rust Belt. Mm, it's not really Rust Belt. It, it's, it, it is Midwest technically, but it's, 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 it's an interesting city. It's, it's a cross between Midwest, South, and with some East Coast influences. Right. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's a it's a it's a mix. Because you started recording there, though, correct? Yeah, sure. Yeah, they pretty much right. You know, out of high school, or you know, shortly out of high school, started doing that a lot. So Green Think was definitely like a Cincinnati thing, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that yeah. Green Think was me and Adam Dose one, uh, just kind of fucking around on a four track in our apartment that we got together do you didn't do one of those songs last night did you no okay i would not know any of those songs (laughs) no unfortunately um but that wasn't the very first thing that you did there was like a tape before that as well i kind of had a tape i was doing congruently with the first green think tape they're both tapes right uh so i kind of like was doing a solo thing at the same time that Adam and I were doing a thing. Right. If that makes sense. Yeah. Of course, of course. Um, it was the same four track. Just pop pop the solo, t- the Y tape out and pop the Green Think tape in. And, you know. Who owned that? It was my four track. Yeah. Um, Ad- Adam owned the um, the Dr. Sample, the, the SP202, and I mm-hmm. owned the Tascam 8 track. So that was the I mean, part-time, track, part-time, part-time people cage. Part-time people cage was that first tape that I made. Yeah, that's dope. Which I was just both. I have owned both. Stuff. Which was like a collection. I had like a there was like a ninety minute version of part-time people cage, and then I I guess I kind of got it down to maybe a sixty minute version or something. Remember remember how long albums used to be back then? Yeah, long, very long. Now they're thirty minutes, man. I know it's a shame. 
Yeah. That's not to say that you can't make a 90 minute album. No, you could. You know. Yeah. Um, was Adam around during that too? You were doing them simultaneously, so he was around. Yeah, yeah, he was around. I, I think. I think part. Of, I feel like part of the time that I did part time people cage, I was living at my parents' house. Maybe that's yeah. a memory I have. But I, yeah, I'm I, sorry to keep making you try to remember all this stuff. Too. No, I it's know fine. it's like ancient. It's fine. I know part of the time I, I feel like I just have vague memories of working at my parents' house, but I uh, I also have memories of working at the apartment. So I think yeah, both. So then, like, how did two? How did you guys meet? Me and Adam. Um, I uh, saw Adam at Scribble Jam. Yeah. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah. That that. Did you see him battle Eminem? Uh, no, I I actually. Um, left before like the uh, the indoor so it was like they had outdoor stuff all day sure and then at the end like the finals were indoors yeah and I think like you had to pay five or ten dollars to get into that and I don't think so I had that five or ten dollars <laughs> and I was underage too it might have been 21 and up so um, I was 18 I guess so I left but um, I did see him battle uh, lots of other people right uh, that day, and he he really astounded me. I, Eminem was was uh, was 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 really good, but uh, Adam was was uh, a lot better to me. I, I he I had never seen anything like it because I I didn't. Well, there's nothing like that guy. Well, there's nothing like that guy. A, but B, I didn't even know any. Uh, you know, to me, underground hip hop was De La Soul and Tribe Called Quest, right? right. So. Right. I, I I had never heard any of the stuff that he was influenced by, which I couldn't even put a finger on that now. If I was thinking, I'd have no idea right. who he was influenced. But, you know, maybe, I, I, I don't really know. I don't want to put right. That's interesting, though, because even going back to, like, the whole, like, the Calex shit and when I first met you, too, is that I think perhaps that's why maybe I had a... Um, a challenging time initially wrapping my head around, like, the ear your earliest kind of, like improv style of like freestyle and yeah. stuff is because <laughs> it was terrible <laughs> no no i wouldn't say that no i wouldn't say it was terrible okay. well i, I, just, I, I simply informed like differently you know yeah, yeah it's all like relative it's just how you interpret it you know yeah. sure it was maybe terrible <laughs> yeah but, like, uh, i don't know i mean I, I i don't part of me would really want to see that footage but part of me really doesn't want to because it might make me feel bad even about myself now you know like <laughs> okay that's a thing that's still inside me that embarrasses me or something you know what i mean perhaps yeah, yeah i mean you were i mean i think you guys trusted me enough to just well uh, some of it was on the actual radio look i was rapping on the radio <laughs> yeah i mean like I, yeah. obviously i i was okay about it when was the last time you rapped on the radio oh i don't know <laughs> i don't know i mean you know i i've done I do stuff on the radio right. occasionally, but now it's but not more, necessarily rap songs. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, you're playing instruments, yeah, playing and singing, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I just love to try to get further to like identify really where it's where your recording shit started. But, I mean, it was all about just fucking DIY, like home record. I mean, I fell in love with with producing and record like in recording like I, I you know as as green as i was back then and i didn't know shit and I, like you know we didn't even know to like ground the record player we we're sampling records right. uh, into into our sp202 and like the whole everything had a buzz on it because we never grounded it <laughs> and it was we just had no idea what we right. were doing but i mean i just loved it i loved it so much and uh you know, I I really Adam was a was a huge influence on me. Sure, and, and um, well, he's also can be very encouraging and like super like motivating guy. Yeah. Especially, I feel like back then too, he was the only person that liked what I was doing. Let me put it that way. <laughs> well, yeah, like that he was the only person that liked what I was doing, and he and he did. He was and he was, you know, I, I could tell that I was I was changing him a bit too you know as as he was shaping me and uh ah, it was just it was a very encouraging um you know important relationship for me uh without a doubt and i i wouldn't have had the balls to do that at that time i mean let me put it this way i mean we're talking about 1997 and 1998 right 
and um, you know, and we're talking about Cincinnati. We're not talking about the Bay Area or New York right. City. And like, you know, for me, I felt. Look, I, I was, I did, ra- I rapped since I was like 15, 16, you know, okay. in my bedroom to that one instrumental on Balloon Mind State. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, <laughs> just like uh-huh. over and over and over on my disc band. And, um, was, you know, would freestyle, would write raps. And I just was trying to be one of those guys that I was listening to and right. the subject matter and the, you know, like everything was just, it just was malarkey that I was trying, you know, I was just trying to be something I wasn't. And, uh, when I met Adam, it really was like, Oh, this is a guy who, you know, is just, doesn't feel like he has to emulate. Look, you can't take race out of it. Right. Hip hop is a black art form. Right. And, you know, as in the 90s, even in the late 90s, as a white person, you know, I didn't really feel like I could do rap um, and take myself seriously mm-hmm. um, as a white guy. Okay. And and I don't know if you can relate to that at all because, you know, being in New York, you know. Well, I grew up in Virginia. So, I'm sorry. Virginia. No, no, no. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Which is, so I grew up like small college town. Okay. So, so I was right, definitely like right. the one, okay. the I didn't, there wasn't like a big group of people, like there wasn't like a hip hop community or yeah. even a mu. it wasn't a musical town, it was a football town, you know, right. and sports, like people grow up to play sports in fucking high school and shit, you know, probably not too different from Cincinnati in a way, although it's a small town, a college town, so... Yeah, I can identify with that. I mean, yeah. and being called a wigger just because, yeah. like, you like hip hop and yep. you like people that have a hard time understanding, you like what you're doing, and you're sort of like out an outcast for some reason for that. Like, so there. Yeah, I think especially if you're of that age from in that period of time in the mid to late nineties. It's not like, like that at all now. No, no. I mean, not it's completely changed. Yeah. But back then, it really was a thing. It really was a thing, and like, and also, but also, not to interrupt you. No, please. Um, also, I think that the genre of hip hop in general back then, regardless of white or black or whatever, it was there was a lot more emphasis put on like paying your dues. Oh, for you know, sure, and and it was proving yourself. It was very um, right taking even taking race out of it. Um, it was uh, what's the word you use for religions when when. Uh, Things are super like, uh, like everything has to be a certain way. Um, I can't think orthodox? of the orthodox. No. Orthodox, yes, yeah, sorta. There, there was, there was a religiosity around the idea of hip hop and and what was okay and what was not okay. Now right. that said, Cincinnati is also an extremely, or was back then especially, and now still is to an extent, an extremely conservative city. Okay, and so I, I think, that. I think that. And it's it's less that way now. It's a lot more open now. But I, I believe that hip hop in in Cincinnati might have reflected that some. So you know, it sure, it, it did that. feel a bit a bit closed minded. Um, and and uh, man, that word is on the tip of my tongue. But I, anyway, uh, yeah. And so I I did feel like yeah. I, we did, you know, we Adam and I both felt like outsiders. We did doing what yeah. we were doing, and and you know there was there was like a, a hip hop night, and we would go to it, and every Wednesday or whatever. But we where we, was that at? A place called Top Cats. Okay, <laughs> you know um, that doesn't exist anymore, though, right? No, does it? I don't think the venue even exists. Yeah, but it was chill. I mean, it was cool, but you know, we 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 definitely. Felt like outsiders. It was like DJs and MCs, or just like DJs playing hip hop, or what was it? Um, no, it was DJs and MCs, and they would have a rap battle, and then you know, and maybe maybe someone, maybe they would have a show sometimes, mm-hmm. if, depending on who was in town or whatever. I think, but because there wasn't a big hip hop like community there, would you say? Uh, there was a hip hop community. I don't know how big it was, right, and, right. you know, and, and also back then you have to remember there was like this serious distinction between i mean back then it was almost like between rap and hip-hop yeah, right was there was like a, like a thing debate. which yeah. to me it's like to me rap is 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 like what you're doing right is the action of you know almost like the verb right 
uh, and and hip hop is like the genre or something. Yeah, but I mean, whatever. rap is this. You could just say sing and rap are kind of similar. Yeah, yeah. you know, they're verbs. Yeah, right. So that that's like what I would say now. But back then, it was almost like you either listened to, you know, with I mean, within rap music or hip hop, whatever you want to call it. You either, you know, in my high school anyway, you either listened to like Master P and like the Puff Daddy stuff or right. whatever was coming out of that. Two very different worlds, of course, but that was like pop rap, you know, right. and that's what like most kids that listened to rap music listened to at my high school. But then there was like the other kids that were like hip hop kids, you know, and like we listened to, you know, like I said, the Native Tongue stuff or right. Far Side or whatever. Yeah, outcast, you know, and the and like, um, yeah. I don't know why I was trying to make that distinction, but it was no. just a different. Well, I think it informs your point. music, the later music that would come up anyway, especially with, yeah. with like when Anticon really started to, in a way, or like kind of really the ball started rolling with like this kind of I guess core group of guys, like when they were all living here in the Bay, and obviously doing. You know, this is an area that has like a rich hip hop history, you know, a rich musical history with lots of like established groups, you know, of all genres, but lots of hip hop stuff. And that like you guys were doing both like individually, because I think everyone had their own individual ambitions as well as like because it was such a kind of seemingly a group collaboration in many ways that it was like a collect. It was soon would be really known as a collective, too. And not like necessarily a record label, but like at the, at that time it was just like this kind of wayward group of guys and um, frat. I wouldn't put it that. I wouldn't. I don't think of it like that way. It, I mean, it's definitely yeah. Very no, I, I'm driven. just yeah. I'm just saying. But I, I, I yeah. I, I think and I you're right and you're right about what you said. But I I think that everyone had their own experience within that. I believe and and I think that some people were more. Um, gung ho and sort of geared towards that like um, swarm mentality, right. you know. And and others were not. You know, I was not as much, honestly. Like I would, I would if they, if people if the guys were like, oh, you know, we're gonna do this posse track, I'd be like, okay, cool, let's do it. But I, I was more focused on doing my own thing, honestly. Like right. I, I was, I was obsessed with uh, recording. And, yeah. and producing and and uh writing and and you know and and just figuring out new sounds and you know how can i make this sound different than the last thing i did i yeah. mean that's what i was obsessed with and that other stuff uh you know the idea of like being like a like a a a, a white wu-tang clan or some shit <laughs> that like i know some of the guys and i don't want to you know <clears throat> nah, put, yeah. put race into it like that but you know that's like I know that that you know that that idea was definitely part of the you know I don't want to make a joke out of it like that but you know the idea of being a crew or posse and right. having an album like that was certainly a high priority for some of the guys and well it's like a common like hip hop distinction too and shit I also think like the press at that point in time like like kind of consistently like misunderstood like what was going on too and it's kind of hard to read and so there's like some probably some general gross miscategorization like i think that sort of loomed like heavily at times i don't know if that's yeah. if that's no. just me projecting no, no, as no, an there outsider was. There, there was like like i remember like like a lot of record stores would ha instead of having like our individual groups in a, in like a, their own sections like there was like the anticon section right. like it was one group you know right and like i know for me when i first started to branch out and do stuff that wasn't really hip hop or didn't sound like hip hop that like you know I remember like the first Y record that was like that like we we had to put like a sticker that said file under rock you know because <laughs> like, like right. we wanted you know we wanted like other people that might be interested in, in our music to be able to catch it even if they weren't you know digging through the, the deep innards of the hip hop section right, at Amoeba right. or whatever. Right. You know what I mean? Like So what album are, are you thinking of when you say that? That was uh Elephant Eyelash that we did that for. But when you say like Oakland Asylum is like 
it's it's close along those lines. I mean, you're singing like all over that record too. Sure, I I don't know. Yeah, 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 for sure. Not to say, I mean, I'm just I'm just curious because the thing is, it's like, I mean, even File Under Rock is like such a like just broad ass fucking. I know, thing, but know? this is but this is also you know also you got to go back and think about the times. Like, of course, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it seemed appropriate at the time. I don't know that it worked at all or that anybody at a record store gave a shit that there was a sticker that said that. They right, still right, stuck right. it right in the Anacon section, which is, right. which is fine, but, you know. Well, in a way, it's kind of, like, to your advantage in a way because you inadvertently can kind of create your own lane that way or, like, subgenre in a way yeah. where it's... Is I've always that like I think after like that first time meeting you and then like that split the split record with No Som came out which is like the really the first I think I got I, got, I think that was the first Wire release right yeah I think yeah. formally as like on Anticon at least you yeah know, I think the tapes kind of came all I think I received like that stuff along with that all within the same year maybe yeah um, and then but the ta- yeah the tapes were like like. If you have that tape, it was because that actual tape I dubbed it, yeah. and and went to Kinko's and made the cover and sold yeah. it to whoever sold it to you. Yeah, you know, but you know, yeah, yeah. So um, I don't know. It's just like it's interesting where uh, how I think with each record you kind of get your maybe personality as like a songwriter and as a lyric writer which is something I really like to talk about, gets um, a little more like, uh, you know, I don't want to say focused, but I mean, it's just a little more pronounced and stuff. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I Definitely, I think that's true up to uh, a certain point mm-hmm. in my history. Uh, and then after that, you know, at this point, I feel like, you know, I'm not necessarily... I mean, I get better at certain aspects of things or figure out more things about myself. But I also, it's just like each thing I do reflects a different time period. But there was definitely like, with what you're saying, there was definitely a long, long like period of figuring out what the fuck I wanted and what, what I was doing and who right. who I was. I mean, I'm still always asking all those questions. Right. Actually. Yeah. I mean, that's just like the journey of life. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. But I mean, when you're 20, the shit that goes through your fucking mind is a little different than when you're 30 yeah. and then when you're 40 and so on. Yeah. But I mean, I think there's... I'm a, not 40 yet, Peter. No. Nah, well, I'm not either, but it's I'm coming. getting close. Yeah, man. me too. Me too. And, but I do think that like that time period in your life between 20 to 30 is like one where... You you know you're kind of fumbling through life and figuring shit out, making a lot of mistakes and stuff, and you know sometimes you figure out you you kind of uh, you know you grow from that or you make them again. But yeah, I think with the records that you did during that period of time, like that kind of succession of those first like like maybe three or four, like it really starts to. I think for me, like Sand Dollars is really the record where it's like I started realizing like oh like. They like he's like making like real songs and shit, you know. Like, I was um, trying, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But- around that period was when I would start to like, okay, so here's the difference. And you said, well, what, what, Oakland Sewer Sound, you're singing all over it. It's true, but Oakland uh, Sewer Sound, like, I was starting. Um, is that how you pronounce it? I've always called it Oakland Asylum the whole the, since this. Well, it's spelled with it has a soul, a soul. In, like blue, you know, like blue in Spanish, right? Uh, uh Interesting. In the yeah, Oakland Asul Asylum. I just made it one word. Right. I don't know what the fuck it means, but uh, where uh, was that pool shot? Was that in California? Or, that was on album cover. That was on tour somewhere. Um, I don't remember where that was, but uh, Adam claims he took that photo, and Dave also claims he took that photo. So I don't know right. which one, which right. one of them took it, but at least back then they did. They both of them thought they took it. Right. Who knows? Right. Anyway. Um, that, uh, what I was going to say is that album was still recorded like, um, where I, I, I don't know how to explain this difference, but like where I would make layers, you know, I heard Brian Eno talking about it on a tape op podcast yesterday, but he was talking about the idea of basically 
recording or, or making songs like a painter mm-hmm. where you know you put a layer down you put a layer on top of that you scrape a little bit of that layer away you add more to another layer you add you know and you basically can write your song as you're recording mm-hmm. okay so i was doing that with oklahoma soul asylum still and everything before that pretty much pretty much uh, yeah, so you start with a at, you start with one layer and then build and then it real, realizes itself basically. Is that what yeah, you're like I'm like yeah, like a song on Oakland the Soul Asylum. I might I might have a cool little uh, guitar riff that I right. like. I would record that you know onto the uh, thing and then I'd add drums to that and then I'd add a bass line and then I'd be like, oh well, I can do th- these lyrics over this. So let me add these over that and. I, yeah. Once we started doing like uh, sand dollars and and uh, elephant eyelash, um, I had started writing songs that like on the piano, like before mm-hmm. before we recorded them ever. You know what I mean? Right. So it's just a different way. It's would you have the process. lyrics? Would you have the lyrics written yeah. first? Yeah. And then you kind of work it out on the piano. Exactly. Before right. before recording anything. Right, right. Be I can I could sit there and sing you the song. Right. You know, and then be like, okay, how should we produce this? You know, like how should this thing sound? Yeah. Well, you would see like even in the later albums, like alopecia and stuff, where you would put out the demos, and they are yeah. like kind of of that same framework and stuff, yep. where you're working it out on a yep. piano because you got a do you have a pi- you have a piano at your crib, right? Like a yeah. grand piano, baby. No, piano. I don't have no grand. No, <laughs> like a fucking acoustic Just a regular. Piano. Right, right. Regular uh, upright piano. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah sorry. Um, yeah, but going back to that, though. So, I mean, yeah, I don't know. There's something about... I remember this period of time, too, very well because it's like... Um, I You were working at the knit. Yeah, like a right? elephant eyelash. Like, yeah. yeah, Sand Dollars came out when I was still in Humble. And then I moved yeah. to New York and, like... I think those records are kind of a couple years apart, if I'm not mistaken. Or... Sand, sand, no, sand, well, Sand Dollars was like an EP yeah. that came out maybe in the spring, and then Elephant Eyelash came out in the fall okay. of the same yes. year. Yeah. I think that was like 05, maybe. Right. So I really, yeah, I was working Something at the like, like maybe the, the following year. Yeah. But uh, I remember, yes, yeah, speak vividly because the Ninny Factory like flew me down to South by Southwest, um, and uh, it was the first time I ever went. And uh, I remember there was like this great paper, I think it still exists, called Show Paper that Todd P, the promoter, like was kind of uh, behind as far as like they were like a newsprint that had like all like the cool shows at South by. It was a Brooklyn based thing, but they did like a South by version. And uh, I was like, it was like my like roadmap and shit, you know, to go to shows. And I was like, I'm going to fucking go to every single one of the shows that Y does like in this okay. South by, you know, just because like I like I know these dudes. I'm going to see other stuff, but just as like an anchor for my trip. So I'm like, all right, if they're playing like at four, then I'll see this shit at seven or whatever, whatever have you. So that particular one, which I think was 07 or 06, I'm not sure. Um, I saw you guys play like fucking like 12 times or something like okay. that. And it being my very first time going there too. And at that time it was like South by was in a really kind of a cool place. It was, it was still grueling, but it wasn't as crazy and, and like, it wasn't as like capitalistic as it is now. Nowhere near. Yeah. And like the East side hadn't been built up at all. That's it was like right. really in that framework of like, it's when the old emo still existed and like you could play just around Red River and all that, that area. Yep. And um, I just remember it being so happy to be able to, because like, in the past, I'd be able to see you guys play like once a year or maybe twice a year. So to catch all these shows, and I love watching you guys play with the band. I think it's like, it's just, you have a great chemistry with those guys, you know? I mean, obviously, you're like really known these dudes, I mean, yeah, for, for a long ass time. Yeah. I mean, your brother's in the band too, you know? So, although I'm curious if he was even in it back then. Um, he was, he was playing yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. He's he's uh, he, he's been down since the beginning as far as why as a live band. Yeah, right? pretty much, pretty much. I may have done like a couple little one-off things without him before he, right. when he was living in New York, um, and then he moved out to the Bay in like '03, I think. So, oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, that was just a very impressionable thing for me. But uh, I wanna, I would like to talk a little bit more just about the 
the writing stuff sure. because it's like I also think it's like a big part. Uh, it's a huge part of your the the albums and your career as a whole. Like the and um, but it's not one that maybe gets um, the proper analysis or like dialogue about it where you know you if you kind of take the lyrics like away from the music because the music is very emotive in many places so it's like gonna it's it's obviously gonna like uh conjure certain emotions like the chord structure and all that shit you know um but if you listen look at the lyrics i mean it's like it totally exists in a very different place too um and I was talking to Brandon about this. Brandon Best, um, the pedestrian. Who said, Yoni was never my... Did I tell you this? No. <laughs> no, what? I'm just going to say it on the podcast. When I when he called me to ask me... This was shortly after Steph passed away. Uh, maybe two days. And he calls me. And he's like, hey, you know, Peter and I are putting together this concert. Will you come out? And mm-hmm. blah, blah, blah. And I don't know, we started, to, he asked me what I've been up to. I was like, oh, well, I was touring all spring because I put out a record in, in March or whatever. He was like, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I love it. It's a great record. I was like, oh, shit, I had no idea you've been keeping up with my work because I haven't talked to Brandon in years. Mm-hmm. And and then he's like, I don't know if he was vibing me or if he was drunk, but it was like 11 a.m., you know, my time. So it must have been like 9 in California or uh-huh. wherever I don't know where I was I was on tour but he's like um and he's like oh no I definitely keep up with your work he was like Yoni was never like my favorite dude or whatever but uh I his music was always my the most interesting out of all the Anacon guys that's what he said to me <laughs> in the third person right <laughs> I'm like okay cool cool cause I, you don't know with him if he was vi- I don't know if he was vibing me or if he was wasted or what I don't know Anyway. I, you know, he has a way with words, that's for sure. And he is likes to engage. And fuck around, fuck with people a little bit. Yeah, so yeah. you have to give it back Which to him I a little bit. Which I respect. Yeah, and I, I'm sure I did. I love that aspect about him, too. Yeah. I, uh, he's a great um, sparring partner, you know, when it comes <laughs> yeah. to, like, you know, yeah. aggressive conversation. Yes. Uh, but very passionate and... Um, extremely intelligent, so, but I interrupted. You were going. You had a thread. You were going somewhere. I was going somewhere. In fact, uh, really, it's inspired by Brandon. And you know, people that might be listening to might be a little unfamiliar, or like, hopefully, they're not. Brandon was. Oh, well, let me just say. I'll say that Brandon was one of the dudes that started Anacon. I would say he may have actually been the original. Yeah, uh, I think him and basically him and, him Tim. and Tim. Yeah, yeah. so uh, pedest- pedestrian. Brandon is pedestrian. And Tim is soul, yeah. And they kind of were the ones, I think, that really started it. Yeah. Um, and, like, pulled people in. And, like, yeah. there was, a, like, very much a community. Like, and Brandon uh, was a... He was a king, a king shit record uh, trader. He was... he was Yeah. Yeah. He was responsible for, you know... Putting, I mean, I'm sorry, tape trader. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, tape tape, yeah, tapes. But, like, as far as, like, introducing, like, a, a lot of different people to free self fellowship and to the project blow yeah and he, to like shapeshifters and yeah um, he introduced me and adam to a lot of that stuff yeah I, I mean adam was already listening to freestyle fellowship for sure yeah before that I, I not me but adam definitely was but as far as all that other more underground stuff brandon sent us tapes yeah well he just has like an incessant like um uh thirst for you know absorbing art and poetry and stuff and i and i and we were kind of talking about your music too and i was just trying like i want i just desperately wanted to be able to get to a place like in our conversation where where we kind of can talk about some things that maybe like your average like you know uh cookie cutter music journalist might not take the time or or have or really have the context to kind of get into really like the the machinery of like um the song structure of your of your work and um i think those records that sort of like preceded <clears throat> or that start and precede you know elephant eyelash they you start to get 
the 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 songwriting starts to get more and more complicated in a way like this, the 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 poetry of it you know the actual written um word and like what you're saying and how you mix like fantasy with like nonfiction and um you know literary device and uh you know just fucking like entendres uh, and like this word motherfucker play. with the entendre <laughs> the, but and like wordplay too and stuff but like yeah. in this way that's not it's like it, it, you're rhyming you know sometimes yeah sometimes you're rhyming it's not yeah. necessarily you know uh traditional rhyme schemes but there's also like some like very like traditional rhyme schemes like a e i o u that that chorus you know where i don't know what the origin of that what that even means you know what i'm talking about the okay. vowels yeah, yeah uh yeah well i understand that those are vowels yeah but whatever that word is that you put in front of them like what is that cheery yes i understand what oh. that word may mean but yeah, put yeah, together yeah. i'm confused oh goodness you, you're gonna make me try to figure out that um you don't have to figure it out but i mean that's kind of like in ex- one of many examples that i can think of i think know? it has to do with the idea of like uh faking it and just like trying to blend in as a happy person right yeah and the, and the vowels being like the the sort of the basics of language and, right and and sort of like uh uh, I'm I'm not always good at analyzing. I'm gonna try to analyze stuff, for, you know, as for much my as sake. I can, but let's yeah. analyze. Yeah, I, I'm I'm glad these. to try, but it, uh, but I do I I do work instinctually for the most part. Well, you I mean, obviously, you leave. There's a lot to be interpreted because yeah. there's a lot of very literal statements that are being made, like you know, uh, and I don't want to regale you with your own lyrics. <laughs> you know, what I'm saying like, especially. I don't, don't. I don't. Definitely don't mean to put you on the spot and be like, no, not at you all. Know, because some of these records too are now like ten plus, fifteen years old and sure. shit too. Um, but yeah, but nevertheless, I mean, there's a certain style of writing, right, for you. A style that I have, you mean? Yeah. I I guess. Have I, you retained I, it? Has is it the same as it was, you know, I don't 2005? Think so. No. I no, I I think that it's always evolving and you know, how I work is always changing and what I'm interested in writing about is always changing too, I guess. Right. Uh I I don't know. I I wish I understood it better what, you know, the process or or how to do it. People obviously must come up to you and be like, want to talk to you about specific songs and shit, though, right? Sort of. I, I don't, honestly, not not that much. And like, you know, thank God for 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 podcasts. I, I mean, like, you know, if you you're talking about journalism and tip, you know, like, this is a game that you've been in for a long time. And like, gosh, I mean, and as a musician that's been interviewed a million times, like, I mean there's no comparison between I mean it's just so much better to actually have a conversation than some person you don't know uh asking you I mean even if I didn't know you this would be so much more preferable to somebody asking me super straight you know questions yeah can't, question answer yeah. can questions right so yeah it's great but I don't know man well I, thank you yeah yeah I I wish I knew more about well, I don't know. If you have a more specific question, that's that's better because I don't I don't really know how to answer like what my style I do have is. a specific question. Yeah. This is start. This is a little a little different than what we're talking about though. But Eskimo Snow, there's two versions of that album. Is there not? Yeah. How, how did you know that? Well, I mean, I, I have both of them. Oh, you have the oh because you maybe you got it from the Anacon guys. Or well, I, I was on to tour you. with themselves when okay. Um, I think I have both of them. I've heard both of them. I might not own, yeah, but there are two different mixes of it's them. just it's just two different mixes. I, I th- I'm pretty sure the album order were, were. I mean, the songs are the same, right? Yeah, but one was more country. Yeah, well, Is I mixed that a gross it. statement. No, I mean, I think that that's a fair statement. I mixed it with a country mixing guy in Nashville. Yeah, I specifically went to him Who was for the sound. His name is Mark Nevers, uh-huh. and he, you know, he he records and mixes like Bonnie Prince, Billy, yeah. Silver Jews, 
uh, lamb chop, so all that stuff. Yeah, and that that's the sound I wanted for that record. That said, after I got it done, it scared the shit out of me because it was it was way straighter than anything I had ever. And I was like, whoa, you know, right. like there's no delay on anything. Right, right. And uh, it kind of freaked me out. Um, and I, I I don't I haven't heard that version in many many years, but uh, there was still something about that version that I actually kind of liked a lot. Yeah, me um, too. I remember because yeah. we were on tour for like uh, like two months somehow. Um, and it was just me, Adam, and Jeff in a van. Yeah. And so we listened to both from what I recall. And that was obviously some years ago as well. Yeah. Um, but, and that's a really brilliant album. And Thank you. And a really well-made album. I think in, it's, I, I remember listening to it and being like, wow, like uh, that you've kind of like completely you know evolved into like it's like a totally different realization and shit you know well yeah and and that you know i'm sure you already know this but that one was recorded simultaneous to uh alopecia that's right the two of those we were that. we recorded in the same sessions and i wrote them over the course of the same year or two or whatever um how intense was that I mean, you know, it was it was business in terms of the recording sessions. You know, um, it was. You business. seem unset, un, like unfazed. What do you mean? Well, it sounds exhausting. Yeah, it is emotionally yeah. exhausting. I mean, all those songs are kind of like yeah, it's, heart yeah, yeah, wrenching. Yeah. No, definitely, definitely. Um, yeah, it is. It, it, yeah, it, it is emotional material. Well, were you when when it was being made? Did you already know that you were delineating one t to another project, or was no, it like uh, -uh. it was late, late, late in the game of recording, where I think my brother and I were having a conversation, like at the we were staying at um, the bass player's girlfriend's apartment, you know, like mm -hmm. she. She was staying, she went to stay with him and like just gave us her whole apartment. Me, Josiah, and Doug were staying there. And uh, I think one night we were like drinking hot toddies every night. Or, you know, it was like the dead of winter mm -hmm. in Minneapolis. I didn't oh, even say man. Minneapolis. Cold as shit. It did not go above zero, I think, the whole time we were Jesus there. Jesus Christ. We were there for a month, uh, five weeks, I believe. Yikes. And yeah, so it was brutal. And so we would just, yeah, chill out. We would listen to, like sketches of Spain, uh, nice man, Miles Davis, yeah. as well as uh, Porgy and Bess, I think. Oh, interesting. And, uh, Miles Good Davis choices. And, yeah, yeah. And, uh, just two of the CDs she had at the house. Right, right, right. And uh, um, you know, and, and listened back to the roughs and stuff from the from that day and stuff. And we just sort of started to get the idea that, like, okay, well, there's kind of two different sounds happening, mm -hmm. you know out of this material and it just felt like there was enough material it felt like well let's let's tease these apart because it does feel like two different things so mm. we started to sort of figure out which songs felt like which went into which you know side of things and and the elephant eyelash was supposed to come out first i mixed it first right so we i went straight from those uh recording sessions in minneapolis to to nashville mixed that album flew straight up to Portland mastered it with another friend of mine Doug Krebs brought it back to Anacon and they didn't know what to make of it <laughs> <laughs> basically and it, then it was like let's go with this other album first yeah well I, yeah they were like well, I we I don't know how to sell this you know and I was like well we do have other material there's other material too for a different record and I played them um, a few roughs, you know, just out of that material, like, yeah, this go, but you know, please finish this one and right. do that. And so that's what I did. So when we, when you did that tour where, and I was, you were, uh, generous enough to, um, invite me along for a leg that was at the tail end of those two records, right? That, no, that was, uh, 2012. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that was, that was, oh, yeah, cause... that was, uh, months, et cetera. Right. That Mumps Etc. came out that fall, and I, I think that was fall that you came with us. Yeah, right? correct. Yeah. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. My bad. No, it's um, fine. Yeah, that was a such a treat. 
I gotta tell you, that was fun, man. It was a good time. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. I, it was. I uh, well, one, I'd never been on a bus tour before, where you know, performing and sleeping on a bus. So that was really cool to have that experience. So I got yeah. thank you for that one. Who um, who who who's on that leg? Was it Adam and Jeff and you? It was, or was it no? It was Serengeti, okay. Adam and me, and Tony, and Tony Trim. Yeah, uh, yeah. Which was a fun bunch of guys, for yeah. sure. Um, but, and then you with the band. Uh, yeah. With like a, um, yeah, like it was like a six piece. Six piece something. band, big yeah. band, yeah. But you were, you know, extremely focused um, from my recollection. T- t- um, yeah, what do you mean by that? Just a very serious Just all serious business, guy. not a lot yeah. of laughs, no, uh, that's not me. a lot of clowning around. That's me. Yeah, okay. Uh, no, and I mean, but I mean, I understand. I mean, dude, yeah. if I had to perform, and there were big, big rooms, yeah, uh, big audiences, yeah, and it's a full national tour, yeah. <clears throat> so I mean, that's a lot of responsibility, and you know, you got to make sure your fucking voice doesn't give out, uh, and you're already like, you know, I'm not a partier. I don't drink, you know, right, I, right. you know. So I mean, you're pretty like health conscious. Oh yeah, I mean, yeah. you know, I deal with you have your health struggles. Yeah, I, I also have mine, and and. Um, I've I've had to I've been forced into being health conscious. Essentially. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, I wasn't always that way. I was. Well, I, sure. I used to party more and drink, and you know. Right. You've always been like I've never known you to really wire no, out. No, I'm not a crazy guy. Right. No. Right. Yeah. No. Yeah. I mean, and being you know health conscious is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. No, not at all. Yeah, it's good. It's good. Well, how are you now? You good? Uh, I'm I'm okay. I mean, you know, it's always a struggle, man. It's, yeah. it's always a struggle, but uh, I I just, uh, you know, I, I just went on new medicine, so hope, we'll see what happens. You know, yeah, it's, yeah. We'll see what where Does that mess with you. Uh, no, I I haven't had any side effects. No, cool. but it's supposed to uh, hopefully within the next like uh, month and a half or something, it'll start to kick in and mm-hmm. hopefully make a difference. Yeah, we'll see what happens. Is it? Inappropriate me to ask what it is. I mean, what, oh no, no, it's fine. It's it's a it's a it's a biologic medicine. I, I, for what though? Oh, for Crohn's disease. Oh yes, yeah, that's, right. that's what auto, I have. It's yeah, like an autoimmune. Yeah, disease. Yeah. And I, I assume you're you're you must be on some kind of of uh, uh, immune suppressant, right? I am. Yeah. Yeah. So I take two, and I take yeah, I take like an immune suppressant and. Um, it's basically, and then like an anti-rejection yep. med, uh, and then another thing for like red blood cells and blood pressure, because I was uh, one of my when I first got my kidney, um, it was producing too many red blood cells, so I have to take something that kind of um, you know. I didn't even know the fucking kidneys made red blood cells. Yeah, they do so oh. much, man. But they produce vitamin D. Okay. You know, they filter all the crap through our bodies. I knew you know? that. That's the yeah, one thing. That's I the knew. big one. Yeah. Um, but they, you know, enable us to pee, you know. Like, for example, and not to go too far into it, but, you know, when I was on dialysis, you know, I could only have, um, uh, I think it was 24 ounces of liquid a day, which includes soup ice cream, ice cubes, you know, as well as water, coffee, popsicles, anything, you know, that melts, yeah, shit, yeah. you know, so I'd have to be very sparing, um, because, uh, because since my kidneys, not that much, no, not at all. And because my kidneys weren't functioning and that's what dialysis is, it pulls that extra fluid off of you too. But there are some people that they can't, they have no function whatsoever and they like, they don't. They don't pee at all, period, you know, and they get it all out in dialysis. They, pretty they much. get it all out, pulled um, from a tube, uh, whether it's in their arm. Um, I fought it and uh, I had a catheter in my chest that went into my heart for the for a whole year. Oh. So um, and so I had to like I bathing was very tricky. Yeah, because you know, I couldn't get it wet because it would get infected and then I have to like do a bunch of crazy shit. So again, I don't mean to get macabre with it, but no, it is, but it is you know it's a I'm, it's a big reality. I'm very curious about that stuff. Because, yeah, yeah, it is a big reality, and you know, oh, on top of all the food that you can't eat when you're on dialysis too, because your your kidneys, you know, uh, like I couldn't have anything that was high in potassium or phosphorus, which is basically like 
the majority of the food people eat. You know, the only so, thing I eat is bananas, dude. Yeah. That's, oh, I can eat a banana. <laughs> yeah. then it would kill me. Yeah, you know, same yeah. with an orange or an avocado or nuts or tomatoes or potatoes. It was um, I eat a lot of berries. Um, berries are good uh, and. Um, Fuck yeah, man. so you you know as well as I do, man, or Brilliant. you know better than I do. Um, it changes you, right? Yeah, yeah. And it ch- it changes your outlook, and it it changes your lifestyle. It ch- you know like, and you can't ignore it. You know, right. it doesn't allow itself to be ignored, or else you die, right? right exactly. So, you know, so I've had to deal with some of that as well, man. Uh, not as dramatically as as you have. Uh, yeah, but it's all, I mean, it's, and it's relative, I mean, especially for someone that's, see, I know I'm not a touring performing artist. You have a pretty somewhat rigorous schedule because you, I mean, in the last few years too, you put out a, like several projects too, which has put you on the road and you gotta, you gotta do that to earn a living too. You know, it is your job. Absolutely. It's a part of the job. Um, so, but fucking traveling and all that stuff is obviously, it's very exhausting. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if you noticed, but I, you know, I, I, I don't, I actually don't remember exactly what I was doing at that time, but I, you know, I don't, I've just started to be able to eat out a little bit, only sushi. Okay. But I, I cook everything for myself on the road or off the road. Do you, on the road? So how do you um, go about doing it on the road? Like just it's, get, uh, you know, residents in, yeah, hotels kitchens. or whatever the fuck and, or Airbnbs and, right. and cook and put stuff in in uh tupperware and mm-hmm. and roll around with a cooler or if i have a bus then just put it on in the fridge right. and what kind of stuff can like you that. cook on the road like i just I'll, I'll cook batches of of something like uh basically my my two main things that I, i'll cook are like uh salmon and vegetables right? right so i'll like cut up pieces of salmon like uh okay i have you know five four ounce pieces of salmon and and then a bunch of veggies and then each of those will go in their own little tupperware for as a meal you know right. or i'll do that with chicken and veggies or you know basically just shop at whole foods everywhere i go right it's gotten a little better recently um uh where i can eat sushi out just because i've been able to eat rice now um but yeah, I mean, yeah, you know, I miss the sushi. I can't really eat sushi anymore. Yeah, raw. I can't eat raw. Right, fish too, da- too dangerous to just in case whatever it might. Yeah, have just, you know, I got a compromised shit. immune system, so yep. yeah, eating raw stuff. Yeah, um, sucks. Because I love the one thing I miss the most is oysters. Oh, yeah. I love oysters, but um, I'll like have a piece of sushi every once in a while. But, yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway, but like, anyway, but but th- just to say, and I don't talk about that shit a lot. Maybe I do every single podcast intro of mine or whatever. Uh-huh. But <laughs> but I try not to like you know bog everyone down with that conversation. But but just know that you know, and you already know it. it it's a big part of your life, and when yeah. when you have something go wrong with your body, and um, you know, it, it takes a lot. Uh, it takes a lot of energy. It takes a lot of your energy up. You know, um, and you know that in a more dramatic way than I do. I've been dealing with it for a very long time. Yeah, no. but not in an acute way like like you have. Yeah, mine was like a sudden explosion that then will have a trickle down effect for the rest of my life because yeah. the, because the transplant is it's the thing that yeah I mean I'm conscious of all, like all the time. I got to take meds every day, every twelve hours. You know, yeah. um, which traveling makes it kind of tricky, but. Yeah, you know. right. With the, with time changes, uh, that's time always changes a game. Such I'm a always place, playing man. that medicine game for time changes. Yeah. Like, you know, yeah. Sometimes I'll just be like, I'm just gonna, I'll just push it into whatever the following morning is of yeah. what I'm doing. Because like, waking up at three o'clock in the morning to like no. take meds, no, it's you just like, yeah, it's like it'll be okay. Yeah. You know? yeah. Um. But yeah, well, yeah, that's. That's part of the life that we're living. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. I mean, geez, that was an unplanned uh, Sorry. tangent. Yeah. No, no, no. I, I mean, you know, that's stuff that I'm definitely I think about a lot. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but and, yeah, music. Yeah. Well, yeah. That's. <laughs> 
so now you're pretty much like have you finished the touring for this this last record because you just did a, a long round right? yeah well yeah we did we toured all spring um you know we've been doing sort of bits and bobs uh little one-offs or little right. like three offs or four offs or whatever um we do have another tour in the spring cool uh or in actually in february so the winter really um and that's that's really still for Moline, which is the yeah, the, the last album we put out. Yeah, um, but it's for like a remix album that's going to be coming out. Oh, dope. Yeah. Oh, cool. Mm-hmm. Of of that. That's you know. I mean, that's that's the technically what we'll be touring on. Right, right, right. Yeah. So the band is still like um, the classic four piece, or what is it? Well, I mean, the band has fluctuated a great deal. Has it? Okay. Yeah, over the over the years. How many people are playing it? Four, four okay. piece. Yeah, I mean, and it's back to the 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 Elephant Eyelash Band. Oh, dope. right so now. Doug, Doug, and Josiah. Matt Melton and Josiah. Nice. Yeah, the cool. classic. That's like the the real classic lineup. That's the that that's the I would say it's not the original Y lineup, but like what was the original lineup? Was Andrew Broder in the original lineup? A- no, a- Andy was in the band. Well, he he was in the band for the albums of uh eskimo snow and alopecia right right. right? but he only toured with us in oh nine um nine and ten 2009 2010 and mark erickson as well yeah i love that record that you guys did the hymns oh yeah you know we're talking about doing a little uh show i don't want to put andy's shit out there but i don't know andy's doing some kind of residency at a spot in, in Minneapolis? In, in St. Paul, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, he asked me if I would come up and do a Jaime show. Oh, know. dude, you got to do that. I think I might I would do love it. to yeah. see that. Yeah. I never... Think we I only ever... did like three shows total or oh, really? something like that. Um, and what we're talking about for the audience out there is, is the album was called Jaime's Basement. Um, I guess that was the name of the band as well. Right. Right? I, I don't think, think it's self-titled. Um, and... Uh, it was what, 2001 or two, three? We recorded it in 2002, I think, or maybe 2003. Uh-huh. And it came out in 2003 or four. Yeah. But yeah, and Andy Broder, Andrew Broder from Fog, uh-huh. I guess it would be. Yeah, he was on the podcast. Most I, well I think he was on yours as well. Oh, it? yeah, he's been on mine. Oh, he's been on yours too. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's another thing. And maybe, you know, before we kind of wrap it up too. Yeah. Um, was just even going back to some of the early stuff, and I know we we already talked about Green Think, but there was this kind of period of time where you kind of you had like sort of these sort uh, one off albums with different people and stuff. I'm still doing that. Yeah, I, I mean, mean the, the Serengeti, the record, we, the Yoni Getty project is yeah in that vein. Um, the one that I love the most, which I think is the most slept on, if not. The most maybe un like a secret one is the reaching quiet. Oh I yeah, love. yeah. Me and Dave. Yeah. Uh, no stone. Yeah. I I I, lo- I, lo- I love that album. Like honestly, yeah. like I don't. I, it's hard for me to go back to uh, to any of that old stuff in a way. But 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 well, definitely. Yeah. I mean, I get it. I mean, it's yeah. Old. You know. For sure. But there's something about that album that that was like that was the start of my my awakening of self. You know, you you were talking about me sort of finding my stride in a way or my style. You know, I wouldn't say really with my writing, my lyrics writing or anything. More like more like me figuring out um, production ideas, I guess. Yeah, right. On that one, and, and feeling like I was sort of figuring out. Uh, you know, and Dave and I both were very interested in sort of how the songs like. Uh, fit up against each other yeah we were listening to like uh 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 frank zappa we're only in it for the money uh uh-huh. you know we were like in art school both of us uh and we were just trying to make something weird and fun and and that was what came out and, yeah you know, I, I think it's a cool record it's a very very weird different kind of record and unlistenable unless you're in headphones and then it's definitely it's, a headphone record. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, I mean, just there's so many. It was such a prolific period too, where you did a lot of these kind of like pretty like way out there records and shit. 
um, that are kind of a trip to go back to now because they're they just exist in a very certain kind of time frame For and sure. the kind of equipment that was being used is, yeah. a, is now a little antiquated and stuff you know what I'm saying <laughs> yeah, to but, say the least yeah, I mean it's very lo-fi yeah um, yeah but I think it, I'd be remiss not to uh, talk at least for a second about Cloud Dead just because oh, I, yeah, I, of course. because I think that um, that group uh, made like I, I feel like a very like strong impact you know even though I think you're right on, on yeah on what well, not to be like whatever tooting my horn, but but I, I it it did it, it didn't you know it was it's not like the the group it didn't blow up or anything like that, but I think it had a subtle like but definite impact on music like pe- other like people that became influential that listened to that a lot and stuff yeah. like that yeah yeah absolutely I think it was super ahead of its time. Definitely. I think so too, and you know what? I never would have known that that music would have gone the direction it did. But now I realize that it was ahead of its time. You know, back then I might have thought that okay, it was just some weird shit that that like, you know, music is going to continue to go in another. But like, but listen to like Drake mm-hmm. and his beats, and and right. listen to, uh, I mean, there's a so many artists that right. that have that sort of feel now. Yeah. Oh yeah, across the genre plane, you yeah. know. Whereas I think back then, people still had a very regimented sense of what to listen to. I think maybe that's why it was Cloud that was really embraced, like by The Wire and stuff like that, by a more like somewhat seemingly sophisticated kind of like intelligentsia. Of, like, yeah, and you had to get out. Of, you had to go to England basically. You had to right. get out of the states because yeah, absolutely, like the framework of the United States, especially then, was like really regimented between like indie rock or like hip hop or I don't know I guess dance music too where it's like this was closer to like a Boards of Canada or something like that where it's like dark and deep but like even like the song structure or something like Physics of a Bicycle and stuff where it's just this it's so like unique unto itself you know it's like kind of there's really no reference like reference point you know to what it you know i guess zappa is like maybe a pretty close one you i know? don't even know i mean I, I have to say like in the same way that you know dave and i really played with you know just we're, we're playing on reaching quiet i mean we the three of us were really it was really very experiment i mean we just were in the most sort of honest sense of the word it is very experimental we were just like we were having fun we were very serious about it in one yeah. sense but we were also clowning like you know what i mean right, and, and right, having right. fun and and not stressing about what does everything mean and what you know just we were really just just we trusted ourselves and we just assumed that like you know it'll all make sense in one way or another or did you guys all live together during this time too uh at times we did, and at times, you know, I, I I don't know which period we're talking about exactly, but because there's the two albums, you know, right. Um, well, there's, and, but then there's the string of releases gosh, that and then there's all those ten inches, like the different ones yeah. that didn't go on an album at all. And we're doing like a, I mean, I'm sure you've talked to Adam about this, but like, you know, we're doing a, a re-release of like all the Cloud Dead material as like a box set or whatever. It's amazing. I hope it happens. I mean, we've been talking about it for like years, so hopefully it'll happen soon. But um, yeah, that would be really, really I mean, quite the, cool. to me, you were talking about reaching quiet being slept on. I think uh, I've and I've even gone back to this in the last couple of years. Um, Ten, the the cloud, yeah. the second top cloud yeah. dead album. Like the first album is hard for me to listen to because it still has a lot of that like. Lo-fi uh, naivete, like definitely, like we, you know, we didn't, we weren't quite in our groove or in our right. shit. But like each of us had come into our own before we started doing ten, and like I really feel like it, that album is so unique and funny, and like you know has. I don't know. It's it's a lot more listenable, you know, in terms of yeah. fidelity and you know. Yeah, yeah. It's produced very well. Yeah, especially I mean, it's still com- lo-fi, but it's yeah, but, but comparatively to comparatively, the first thing, yeah, way different. So then I don't know. I I, I th- that one is just it has such a good sense of humor, um, and like 
I, I remember a, cu- a couple, two, three years ago, um, I put it on when I was running one time, and uh-huh. I just, I straight up lol like, most of that run. I was just <laughs> yeah. fucking cracking up to myself. Like, I gotta go back to it. I haven't listened to it in a long time. It's a funny album, man. Like, yeah. I, I wonder if people would associate it as, like, as a funny album now. I mean, I mean or I, back then when it came out, rather. To me, everything... To me, everything we do, whether it was Wire or Cloud Dead, like all that shit has so much sense of humor in it. Or you know, any Adams, you know, themselves are subtle. Like there's so much humor in all that stuff. Like I know you really have to read, but it's dark humor, of course. It's absolutely dark yeah. humor, and it's uh, is very referential too. Yeah. So if you can, if you can kind of put the puzzle together, even ever so slightly, too, yeah. you kind of reveal these. Pretty hilarious, like inside jokes and stuff. Yeah, you know? I think so. I think my 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 more recent music uh, is not as funny. Maybe, man. Well, I think that uh, the album that I did that you came on tour with us, the Marks, yeah. etc. To me, is very funny. I don't know how many people got the joke, but to me, it was huh. very funny. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, <clears throat> the you know you can only can control what how someone interprets your music only sure, so far sure. you know yeah um, and that's the thing with anticon in general too i think a lot of the songs were misinterpreted you know probably um, yeah uh because your guys as a collective that the sense of humor which I, all that's the one thing i remember most because i kind of came came into that group of guys um first sort of just like as a like more like a you know a buddy that was you know filming and writing about it a little bit and less as uh like a consumer so i had the privilege privilege rather like hanging out and realizing that really everyone there is actually extremely funny and witty and yeah very sarcastic we were all trying to make each other laugh yeah. that was like yeah. what anacon was in a right. way i think in, in you know in one sense of it anyway yeah yeah, I don't know. I think it. I think it. Looking back, I mean, there's a lot to be said for it. There's an incredible body of work from that, like that period of time, like this period of time, and especially with some of those records that you did, like, um, you know, from the early 2000s to the like when you were still living in Oakland, because now you're you're back in Cincinnati, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I basically lived in in Oakland and Berkeley for my my 20s. Right, right. Yeah. It's that m- music when I'm here. Because I only get to come back to the Bay, like, ever so often. Like, it feels very much like it's from here. Right. Like, yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, it's a part of the vibe here, you know. Um, and I don't know. Uh, I think it, it's all really special to me. Like, your music has a special place, like, in my heart. Just because I've seen it kind of, you know, go through these different you know phases and levels and shit man so um yeah i just appreciate that you that you're doing it and that you've had you know some strong success and you you can hit the road and you got people coming down and i think it's dope man i you know i do yes thank you thank you peter yeah thank you no doubt yeah yeah what were you gonna say well i was just gonna say you said you know i i I have to remind myself that 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 is that is success you know the fact that i i can go out and have people come to the shows it's great you know because i i always you know, I always see the shortcomings, you know, I always see like, well, the, sure. you know, um, because, you know, I have a lot of friends that are a lot more successful than me. And, you know, you, you, you know, you always kind of, that's a, a theme that, that a lot of people have touched on in, in my podcast and is that you do always sort of look to uh, other folks that are, that are doing better with what they're doing, but whatever. I, 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 I my sister also told me today that I should be writing a, gratitude diaries or something like that where she'll like <laughs> she'll like write like her like five like every night you sp- before you go to sleep write five things that you're grateful for so yeah i mean look man i can go to any city any major city in the country and pull people you know uh into the room to listen to my music awesome I mean, it's awesome. That so, not a lot of people can say that. Right. Sure, you can compare yourself to some other artist right. or look and see where they're at. But as far as like the level, the fact that you've like put out like over ten albums, 
like a multitude of other releases on top of like these those early collaborations which kind of like exist in their totally different realm like you know from like cloud dead and and the stuff with broder and you know just and all the inner anticon collaborations that happened in the early years like yeah some of that stuff is just it's like invaluable and uh timeless shit that that you that no one can take that away from you yeah, it just all gets weaved into the. You know, it's it's, it's interesting. You know, we, we we really are one organism. All you know, all all, all these uh, humans and yeah. I mean, even the you know everything else on this planet. You know, it, it really is one thing, and it's all the all the music that we do just gets weaved into this like fabric of consciousness. You know, and yeah. and sort of uh, musical emotion uh, or something like you know musical intelligence of 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 the culture and and uh you know like we said like you know cloud dead had some influence on on some things that came after it and i'm sure that wise had an impact on 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 people as well and i mean it's 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 cool you know it's like it's really cool and like even if you know I, you know i don't ever become a huge millionaire star or some shit it's awesome to know that I'm part of this, you know, I'm, I'm part of the, 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 you know, I'm a small part of the musical history of, of, uh, the last 20 years and, and yeah. hopefully, hopefully I'll continue to, to be a part of that. I sure hope so. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate you, uh, doing this with me too, man. Oh, Peter. And in the back. Absolutely. Bay. Absolutely. My pleasure. Yo, yo, I want to say thank you for listening. All of you. Uh, to my guest, Yoni Wolf, thank you. Uh, yo, everybody, just be well. Take care of yourself. Hey, if this is your first time ever checking out the podcast, The House List, uh, I'm your host, Peter Agostin. Every episode is edited and engineered by CJ Stewart. Please subscribe if you can. I would really appreciate it. And even so, copy and paste it. Send it to a friend. Let them know. Yo, check this shit out. When you're at your Halloween party coming up. Be like, hey, yo, I like your con, uh, your fucking costume, dude. But but more importantly, have you ever heard of this podcast? It's called The House List with Peter Agostin. You should check it out. It's great. He does it for the love, on the strength, for you, for free. Uh, uh, so you should subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. Also, hey, if you aren't familiar with Yoni's work and you by some chance just listen to this uh, because of this podcast, uh, one, that's awesome and amazing. But go back and peep out some of the albums he's done. I mean, the guy has just released a, a new record earlier this year called Moline. But also, if you go back, some of my favorites uh, in his catalog, uh, Eskimo Snow from 2009, Alopecia from 2008, Elephant Eyelash from 2005. Uh, those are great, great records to dig into. Um, the, I know I mentioned Sand Dollars, which was an EP that he did in 2005. But those are that's a great starting point. But the guy's a pretty prolific uh, artist. I would even go back to the Cloud Dead records too. And um, a word is there's going to be a big reissue of all that stuff too coming in 2018. So look out for that as well. So yeah, check it out. I'm going to end on some music, but uh, I'm not sure what Y song I'm going to play just yet. So I'm, I'm going to try to uh, find something that I like that I'm going to put up. And yeah, man. I will catch you guys on the next episode. Thank you so much for the continued support. Sorry for the long break. And, uh, you know, be well. Love one another. You know, stay healthy. And, uh, yeah, just uh, enjoy life, y'all. Uh, love you. Peace. <laughs>